This podcast is for you if you want to learn about the wonderful and wacky world of the English language and the people who speak it. If you want to learn English, speak English, and understand different speakers of English, then you're in the right place and you're going to love our podcast episode today. Welcome to English World with Chris Americos. We are a team of language lovers, expert teachers, and native speakers who are on a mission to help people around the world speak English and show the world their true value. We correct mistakes, practice pronunciation, and explore grammar rules while drinking coffee and having fun. So get comfortable, relax, grab a pen and paper, and welcome to the show. Today's episode is brought to you by English Every Day, an unlimited speaking practice program where you can join live speaking practice lessons with professional native teachers five times every day. There are a lot of courses on the internet and a lot of useful videos too, but the one thing that is missing for most English learners is practice. And if you need speaking practice, then English Every Day is for you. So click the link in the description or go to chrisamericoast.com to learn more today. All right. So today we have Jeff from Fluent American with us. And Jeff, how did you get started as a teacher and, you know, your your English uh, YouTube channel? People are learning English from you on YouTube. So how did you get started in that? So I'll give you the short story first. If you want the long story, you can ask for a long story. Uh, <laughs> short story was I was working. So I got my master's degree in TESOL. So teaching English as a second language. Um, I didn't get certified to teach in schools. Um, I was thinking about doing that, but I didn't feel like getting certified. So I started working at language centers. And then as I was working at language centers, I was like, it, it might be good to also look at other avenues too. So I started teaching online on the side. And then one thing leads to another and you see other opportunities and it's like, Hey, maybe we could start branching out, finding other students and things like that. So then I decided to start the YouTube channel with horrible, horrible videos. As you do, you know, your first hundred <laughs> videos are, <laughs> they're still there, but um, yeah, they're pretty, pretty bad. Um, but you learn well, how things. Many, how many videos have you put out total? Do you, do you know, or estimate or. So that's another kind of tricky question too. Cause it's like, like videos were like, I'm just putting out some quick things. Like, cause there's a lot of like short videos where it's like, like describe a picture. Like I'll show a picture and I'll just like circle words and like identify vocab. So like, I would imagine there's probably like a hundred of those. Um, there's also real quick, just like shadowing videos I've done. Uh -huh. um, in terms of like traditional videos where I'm actually like, it's me in frame, like teaching a concept or things like that. Um, also there's probably between like five to, 600 of those but in total the whole catalog including like the live streams and things like that we're, we're probably pushing about maybe like 1100 1200 it's a lot there's a lot wow yeah that's a lot of time and energy to invest into a youtube channel tell that to my wife yeah <laughs> <laughs> she's already she's already scolding you about it or <laughs> she i mean i'm it's hard because so i'm a during the day i take care of my son um, he, he started preschool this year, but he's there for, you know, two hours a day. And uh -huh. like that, I can't even teach during those two hours. Cause like half of that time I, I need, I need to get him there. And then by the time I'm back at a place where I can teach, I can't even, I have to wait for like the next time frame. You know what I mean? So it's like yeah. more or less, I, I've been watching him during the day since, you know, he, he's four and a half years old now. Um, and so, and then in the evenings when she comes home, I teach, you know, so like everything that you see on YouTube is basically done in between the hours of like <laughs> eight or 9 PM and like midnight <laughs> pretty much. Yeah. That's so yeah. interesting. Cause I'm like the opposite at that time. I just completely don't function and I, my brain just turns off. So I have to go to sleep. Oh, I'm and the same way too. Don't <laughs> watch the videos. Like <laughs> <laughs> I'm the same way too. <laughs> But it's like if it, I mean I think if you if you're serious about something you you make it work you know you're in a position where you can get stuff done during the day and that's sweet you know I'll hopefully fingers crossed my son starts a full day program next year and I'm just like oh my gosh like eight hours during the day like I can't even it's been so long since I've had that sort of schedule I'm I'm super excited for it because there's so many more things I can do you know you guys are about to have another kid right yeah <laughs> you ready three months 
So that's wild. Yeah. But uh, yeah, I just got back from the beach with my daughter because my wife is having her second baby shower. Uh, she had an English baby shower. Now she's having a Russian baby shower. Oh, is she Russian? Yeah. Got you. Got you. Does she talk to your kids in Russian? Yeah, yeah. My daughter speaks Russian. And that's great. Yeah, that's what's up. Russian all the time. And yeah, that's so cool. We yeah. asked her, oh, when your little sister comes, is she going to speak English or Russian? She says, she's going to speak Russian with mama. She's going to speak English with papa. <laughs> <laughs> it's crazy because like, um, I don't know if I told you so again, I talked to about Italian. Uh, I talk in Italian to my son. And my wife like she doesn't know anything about Italian, but she's she could like test out a like beginner level Italian stuff just from listening to us. Like it, it's, it's huge. You know, that's awesome. Yeah. yeah. It's so yeah, cool. And she's picking up some Spanish too, because we go once a week to the local library and they have a free Spanish class and they teach her like so cool. one word a week. And <laughs> we, and so she'll, she, she'll come up to me and she's like, Papa Ocho. <laughs> like i'm not prepared for it so I, i'm like what are, you, what are you trying to say and then my wife's like oh she's speaking spanish that's so uh, <laughs> that's actually i remember reading a study about they were like looking at um people like situations where like you're in a classroom setting and there's a lot of language switching and they found that that actually is um in some ways is less helpful like when you're learning a language because you're not prepared for it. So it's like, you're like, Oh, now I'm in something. Oh no. Like, it's just this constant kind of, so it's kind of artificial. Um, and so I think that's really, you know, if you're not primed for it and it just catches you off guard, you're like, wait, what, <laughs> what'd you say? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I can totally see that. Yeah. What are the challenges of being a parent as a YouTuber? That's something that I've never discussed with someone before. And it, and it just came up organically now. So like, I'm, I'm thinking about that Yeah. and like, yeah, there's, you're like in the middle of recording and then someone screams in the background and that's the, oh that's, God. I was doing a, I remember I was doing a live on my YouTube and my daughter was screaming. We had, we were in a different place and the room was like right next yeah. to my, office. so mm -hmm. screaming, screaming. And someone comments like, Hey, Chris, don't you uh, need to go check on your kid? <laughs> I think we've all, I think if you have kids, we have all been there. We've all seen the video of that one guy that's like on the <laughs> conference call and the, the kid comes in and the stroller comes in and the mom comes in. Um, I mean, we've all been there. I mean, I don't, right now I, I like my microphone here, but I, you know, I started off with like a, a snowball. I don't know how core, how geeky we want to get into like tech stuff. I started off with like, you know, a typical like condenser, all noise, all the noise at all times. Um, like Ubisoft, like, um, a snowball or whatever the blue yeti snowball um which just captures all the noise you know it's, it's a good mic but it just captures everything um and so but you just you know gradually you piece things together i think um that's another reason why i do stuff at night uh, because he's asleep thank mm -hmm. god he's generally a pretty good sleeper um i think and also i mean my wife's a teacher she teaches high school so it, you know in some ways it's worked out for us i think as you know as best as it could i mean no one, no one like, I think like wants to spend time away from their family doing work. You, you know, you want to be with your family, but at the same time, I, th I think what we have is the best, you know, when I'm working on video stuff, she's grading or lesson planning, or she's big into chess. Uh, so she does like chess stuff. Um, and I work on the, the videos and things. Um, she has summers off, which is helpful, you know, so then during those times we can spend more time together. But, you know, it's a sacrifice because, yeah, I can't weekends. I I'm doing work most of the time, you know, because that's that's my work day. And then she watches my, my son. So I think you, you navigate your schedules. That's that's what marriage is. You know, I think marriage. I was listening to an interview with Michelle Obama. And one of the things that she mentioned is. No marriage is 50 50. You know, it's, it can be 55, 45, it could be 60, 40, but no marriage is, you, someone's making a sacrifice in some way, you know, and I think this is just the time where I'm sacrificing my work, you know, to make sure we can do things with my son, because I don't know where most of your listeners are from, but if they're not from the U.S., childcare in the U.S. is super expensive, you're, you're looking at, yeah. you know, 
twelve hundred dollars a month for childcare is like, oh, that's a good one. We better reserve, <laughs> better reserve that spot. Right. You know? And and when I first heard the, these numbers here, I was like, no, 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 no. Like you have to look somewhere else. And then it turns out that like eight hundred is an amazing find. That's a, that's a really good. Yeah, that's a good. And, yeah. <laughs> yeah. And before before that, I never imagined that it would be that expensive. You know. Yeah, uh, I mean even. You know, you look at different countries too. I mean, a lot of countries, the expectation is the grandparents will come, right. you know, uh, I had <laughs> some Chinese students and, uh, you know, they, they had kids and their, his, um, his parents had come and then they told his parents right as their kid got to like four or five, they said, Hey, we're having another kid. And their parents got upset because now they got to, you know, they moved across country to help them out with the kid. Now they got to be there longer. I mean, I, <laughs> I get that. <laughs> I get that. You know, it's, it's a time commitment, you know? True. Yeah. The um, cultural difference is big. A lot of the Russians that I know, they like a good percentage of them, their, their parents came over to help them with the kid when they yeah. uh, went through that. And I don't know, you know, I think there's pros and cons to that. Like it's great to have a support yeah. team and especially, uh, you know, the mother has the hardest job here and, so she has to deal with so much to have that additional support, I think is great. Um, we didn't have that for our first one. And so I saw the, the uh, great amount of pressure that is put onto the mother with, you know, no. and then, you know, it's not just her, but um, like you try to support too, but there's only so much that you can really do. <laughs> A lot depends on the age too, right? Cause I mean, if they're, you know, up to, you know, I forget all the age milestones and things like that. <laughs> um, maybe some press memories. I don't know. But, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but yeah, I mean, as a dad, like, you know, you wake up and like the kid, you know, needs feeding and they may not be at that bottle stage or may not take to a bottle as easily. Yeah. Um, you know, so there's only so much I can do, you know, like it, it kind of has to be the mom in some ways. And even if, even if there is a bottle, I, in some ways my, my wife still need to wake up because she's still at the pump because it gets super uncomfortable, you know? So it's like, so in some ways it's like, no, just give me the baby because it just makes things easier, you know? Yeah. Um, I so. wonder how many people who watch this are going to be like, those guys don't understand anything about. <laughs> <laughs> Fair, but I think <laughs> I've actually gotten into like these, this, this, these, these like deep discussions about <laughs> like breastfeeding and stuff <laughs> like that. <laughs> but I'm like, yeah, obviously not qualified to, to go into that topic today. <laughs> <laughs> what I what I will say is that <laughs> it's super rewarding being a dad who's able to spend as much time with my son um, as possible. Because I know for traditionally for most fathers that is just not the reality. You know, being able to take care of my son, you know, from like seven in the morning until five o'clock in the evening every day is a very tiring experience, but it's, I'm very fortunate to, to be in that position, you know, and I, and I get that. You know? yeah. yeah. Um, so like we were talking about the YouTube channel and growing a YouTube channel, publishing videos, it takes time that could otherwise be put towards family or, or something else. Right. Yeah. So a lot of people look at YouTube Google, Facebook, Instagram, TikTok, everything, and kind of say all of social media is evil. And that, you know, it's sure it maybe is connecting people, but it's not worth the price that we have to pay of basically being the product of the, of the platform. Where's the balance between, hmm. because it can take over your life. You can take, it can take over your life as just a passive user of, of it. And as a uh, content creator, like, it can just it can just take up so much time. So, uh, wh what's the balance? What do you think? I think having a goal in mind when you're using social media is probably the most helpful strategy. I'm not personal use of social media. I'm like I'm not I'm not on anything. I don't do it. If I'm on Facebook, it's for business stuff. If I'm on Instagram, it's for business stuff. If I'm on YouTube, it's for business stuff. So like. When I'm approaching it, I'm often pro approaching it from a, a producer creator standpoint. I'm not approaching it necessarily from a consumer mm -hmm. standpoint. And from that perspective, 
I mean, it's super helpful. I mean, I mean, I, I, I'd love to hear your perspective on this too, but I imagine that your business would be very different if you weren't able to access social media for, for what you do. Absolutely. Um, it, it drives content. It's for instance, I have a program we use Facebook as for, for our program because Facebook allows me to do a live stream where I can have students join me on screen and we can do pronunciation exercises together. And when that stream is done, it's saved in the group that they can then rewatch that lesson forever. You know, yeah. so now we've, we've got like 300, uh, we're, we're approaching 300 lessons on there, you know? Um, there's no other platform where I can really do that so easily, mm -hmm. you know? So, so, and if I decentralized it on my own platform, um, then you run into a host of other issues. Cause then you have to worry about, you, you know, you have to worry about server space, file sizes and things like that. You know? So I think if you're approaching social media as a tool and as a resource that can help you achieve a certain goal, I don't think there's a problem. I think the problem often comes in when people are aimless and just kind of being taken wherever the algorithms take them. You know, in that case, you're not in control. And that's where I think it can lead to pretty undesirable outcomes if you're not careful. Switch over to TikTok. Mm. There's been a lot of talk about banning TikTok in the United States. Yeah. I, a couple months ago, was at somebody's house who works in the in the government and they don't let their kids have tiktok on their phones yeah. um they told me like when i came to their house they're like yeah if you have tiktok you have to delete it before you come to our house oh wow so i was like okay whatever i don't really care so i deleted yeah. it and just put it back after or whatever mm -hmm. so yeah, yeah. but but i didn't realize how much of an issue it was um and now a lot of states and and even federal government are talking about these these things so what do you yeah. think Should the u.s ban tiktok you know it's, it's tricky because like no social media company is like an angel <laughs> I, I think the i think the concern is that yeah the social media companies aren't angels but to this point they've all kind of been their own independent thing whereas now you have or at least there's a perception that they were independent um, who knows really but with tiktok the connection between what they do with information and the Chinese government is just so, so much more susceptible mm -hmm. that, I mean, from on the one hand, I don't really care. I don't use TikTok. I don't, I don't know if your channel has a TikTok component. We, I don't have a TikTok component. Um, you have a team. I'm, I'm a, this is a one man show, man. <laughs> uh, you, can, you can focus on one platform. Definitely. <laughs> um, so it's, um, it's like, I don't, TikTok never really personally appealed to me directly. You know, I know education TikTok's a thing. Um, and I know people are, the numbers you have there are great. Um, but at the same time, I, I get, I get the concerns about where that information is going. And the reality is that, look, I mean, Chinese companies, unfortunately, have been caught so many times, like taking like proprietary information to then make their own versions. I mean, I don't know if you've ever used, so we're using Zoom right now. I don't know if you've ever used the, what's the Chinese version of Zoom? It's like, boo, or I forget what it's called. I, I use it with some uh, students sometimes. It, it looks just like Zoom. <laughs> it's like everything looks exactly the same. And there's so many of these sorts of situations, right? Um, and so, and, and also the fact that you know, with algorithms, I mean, they literally have proven with algorithms, like for TikTok, they can literally like push a button to promote someone. They're like, oh, we want this person to go out. So now we're, we're going to push this button and now they're going to reach all these people. So is it unfathomable that the government could be like, hey, we want to now start promoting this sort of thing or like, hey, we're going to just promote videos that convey this idea and things like that. Um, I mean, I can't, I can't, dismiss that idea entirely like i could see that happening and it's unfortunate that i know there's lots of people that have built up honestly their livelihoods <laughs> on tiktok and that's obviously a painful switch but at the same time you also have to realize that if you're making content on a platform you don't have control because if the platform just decides hey uh we're not gonna show you anymore 
what are you going to do? You have no, you have no impact to that. I mean, that's why right. things like email lists become so important and spreading out becomes really important. Um, yeah. And you might not even talk to a human ever about your account being blocked, shut down, whatever. Yeah. Yeah. Facts. I mean, there's just so many things that are outside of your control. So I think, I guess I personally don't have an issue with TikTok gets banned. Mm -hmm. And I think that for a lot of people that are especially concerned about it, um, I guess I, I wonder where the concern is largely coming from. Is it become, are they truly, is it truly a fear of like, oh, freedom of speech, First Amendment rights are getting violated? Is that the real fear or is the real fear something else? What's going something on? Kind of yeah, I don't. Or like, I don't know, like it, it could be selfish, like is just because like, oh, you built your business there. Or, oh, you like the idea that you can find followers easily, more easily there or just some like self-validation kind of thing. Mm -hmm. You know, I don't, I don't, what, what, are, what are your thoughts on the ban? Yeah, I think it's a security issue and that, yeah, they don't have an issue with an American social media company exploiting the entire population of other countries. But if someone else tries to do that to us. No, 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 don't do that. Um, I think that's kind of the approach that they've taken. Yeah. Yeah. hundred percent. It's uh, yeah. very similar to the approach they take in many situations where it's like, we can influence elections in other countries, but if you do it, it's, yeah. you know, I, 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 but I don't want to get too political, but I guess that was a <laughs> question, right? So um, how much of social media do you think is real and how much is fake? Because there are so many stories of fake things and fake people. And um, is it all a mirage? Are we living in the matrix? Mm -hmm. Or is, it, uh, is there some reality out there? Mm -hmm. When you say fake, can you elaborate on that a little bit? Yeah, I mean, it can be whatever you want it to be. But um, something that is not real, let's put it that way. And real, like we could define that differently too, right? Like, a person being two faced yeah. or a person saying one thing and then, and not right. meaning. But, but I feel like a lot of people create maybe a persona to present to people. Um, and I mean, I think I'm included there. And so you present this face and these positive qualities and like, it's just common sense that you don't mm -hmm. typically show your weaknesses or something like this. So mm -hmm. you always post the picture of you on the top of the mountain, not you falling down it mm -hmm. and stuff like that. Right. Um, I don't know if, typically. I don't know if you, um, if you listen to a lot of there's, there's a marketer, Seth Godin. Um, mm -hmm. And one of the things that he talks about a lot is, people claim to want authenticity, but people don't actually really want authenticity. You know, for instance, the one example he gives, if I'm not butchering it, is that, you know, you, you go to a hospital to have a surgery and your surgeon comes in and says, Oh guys, I'm, I'm sorry. I'm just, we'll go, we'll do the surgery. I'm, I'm feeling really upset today. You know, like uh, just a lot going on at home. Like you don't want that. Right. You, you want, you want the surgery, like you're there for the surgery. So it's like, and, and that's okay. And, and there's nothing wrong with that. That that's fine. And, and I think with social media, it's kind of the same sort of thing. People say that they want authenticity with social media, but that that's not real. You know, I, I don't think that's actually what people desire. I mean, we, we see it for instance, there's, there's what that app, what, uh, be real where people were like taking pictures, you know, like, Oh my, the alarm went off. I have to take a picture <laughs> of these random things I'm around. Um, really? <laughs> I I've never heard of that. really? That's, that's a real, I mean, it's in like, a, <laughs> not to go on a tangent, but I remember I was here reading about like, there were like these advertising companies that joined be real. And they're like, man, this is really hard because you know, you don't know when the notification is going to come through. So like they would send teams cause like they're okay. We need a picture of like times square or whatever. So they would send a team to wait at times square, like all day for the time when the, the thing would actually go off. So then you could actually get the picture, you know? Um, but bring it back more to social media in general. You know, I think, is it fake? Yeah, I mean, it's it's highly cur it's at least curated. You have people, you are choosing what you allow people to see, versus allowing them to see what exists at all times. So in that sense, yeah, it's not real. It's not it's not authentic. I guess part of my interpretation of the question too is is that a positive or a negative? Um, mm -hmm. And 
I, th- I think it's neutral. I don't, I don't think it's a good thing or a bad thing. I think it's just, it's, it it's, is. it's just how, to, yeah, it's, it's what the system is. You know, you, you take it, um, you can use it as a tool in a positive way, or you can use it as a tool in a negative way, but it's, it's all about how are you deciding to use it. You know, if you're using social media and it, it's putting you in a negative headspace, then that's obviously a sign that we we need to find some other sources of entertainment, you know, yeah. but I, I, I don't think you can approach to go back to your question. I don't think you can approach social media as being something that is indicative of what is, is real <laughs> in the world. No, but there are real people that are doing those things and, and putting themselves out there. You see real people's faces with real people's names you can find real information about real people. Um, so how much of your personal life should you put out there? And mm. like, how much should you keep back? Because people do see that. And it does have real life consequences sometimes. It does. It's, I think a lot depends on who you ask. You know, if you talk to someone that's like, heavily involved in like cybersecurity and stuff, they're, they're probably be the first people to tell you, no, like don't. And if you can hide it, you should probably hide it. We're living in a time where I think people have grown up sharing their entire lives. And even if they haven't shared their entire life, they're also sharing the lives of others. I mean, with, with kids, I don't know how you approach social media with your kids, but for instance, we actively try to keep from putting pictures of our son online. And part mm-hmm. of that just being, I think it's hard with social media too, because so much of it is done in a public space. So you're taking pictures and it's not just you or your friends in the picture, but there's other people involved in the pictures as well. There was, um, I don't know if you saw that artist, his, the artist basically just, I forget his name. Um, he just goes around Instagram. He picks random pictures from Instagram and makes paintings of the pictures <laughs> and then people have seen pictures of like, oh my gosh, that painting was from my bedroom <laughs> and stuff like that. So, I mean, it, and, and so I think what it demonstrates is the fact that when you're putting stuff out onto an online space, I think a lot of people don't fully appreciate the impact of the action that they have undertaken. Mm-hmm. Because the reality is if you put it onto the internet, it is a public accessible place that people can find the things that you post and that you do. We see that with celebrities, you know, with in terms of things that they post before they were stars or before they were star athletes, you know, something you tweeted 10 years ago, you're still liable for. Mm-hmm. Whether, that's, whether that's fair or not, you're, you're still held accountable to it in the eyes of many. And so how much information should you put out there? The the honest answer is probably very little, but the practical answer is however much information you're willing to share with the understanding that it might come back later in a form that you didn't expect. As a content creator, you're constantly putting it out though. For sure. Like from, from my perspective, yeah, 100%. Um, it's, it's a trade-off. I mean, I think if you're, if you're trying to do like a business or something like that, you you have to be willing to put something out there, but there's ways to limit that as much as possible, whether, you know, getting like a PO box for your address instead of using your normal address or um, getting a separate phone line and things like that. Those are all smart measures you can do to kind of protect yourself. But ultimately if someone wants to even work around those, they can find ways. I think, I think that's kind of the, the other issue too, is that I think a lot of people have the mindset does. Well, they can find all this information anyways, so why not just give it to them? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you know, which. Well, they can break the window in my house, so why would I lock? <laughs> I'll just break it myself. <laughs> why would I lock the door if they can break the window? <laughs> but I mean, but but in all honesty, I, I think some people do approach it that way. Yeah, you know, I don't know how you feel about door locking, but ever since living in Russia, it's like every lock is always locked. <laughs> I, grew, I mean, I grew up in. Philadelphia. Um, I love Phil- Philadelphia. It's my favorite city by far. Um, but there, you also need to, you know, keep ahead about you, mm-hmm. you know, and um, you lock your doors and ideally you also get mm-hmm. like a deadbolt, <laughs> you know, it's um, an urban area. Like, yeah. But I think 
people who don't live in urban areas in the States approach that differently. And that's what, that's where the humor comes in, right? Because mm. there are a lot of people out there who feel like they don't lock their car or door because they live in a safe place, for example. Or their car. Yeah. 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 Mm. It's, it's, it's true. I mean, we have friends that, um, you lived in the suburbs and like you could go up to their house when no one was home and you could open their, they, they would, they would have a door that was open, which is, this is a different lifestyle. I mean, if you, if that's you, do you. Cool. I, I'm glad nothing has happened to you. I hope it stays that way. But I think that that was a good comparison that you made between uh, that type of security and putting your personal information out there. Um, are there any topics that people just categorically shouldn't consume content about? Like if they're aimlessly scrolling, like we were talking about earlier mm -hmm. and you know, they can be taken in lots of different directions. So there's some stuff that might really, really hit a nerve or really impact. Mm -hmm. You look at a lot of the content that tends to do particularly well. Um, you could even look in the YouTube ESL space like we did before. Um, there, there tends to be, con people are drawn to controversy. They may not like it, but they're drawn to controversial discussions and topics. I, I think... You know, it would be great if viewers approached content constantly with a critical eye and asked themselves questions like, what was the intention behind this video? Did it achieve its goal? You know, how is this functioning? What devices are they? You know, just like keeping in mind all of those sorts of levels of critical analysis. But the reality is that sort of analysis is not actually happening. And so it makes things dangerous in the sense that, I mean, this is how things like, for instance, like, like stereotypes can get promoted, which can be harmless on one level, but can lead to very negative consequences, you know, especially if you're presented with an idea that's offensive or harmful to a group of people over time. And if you're repeatedly shown that sort of content, you, you know, that can really influence people. Yeah. Uh, and sort it's not a, even at a conscious level, you know, it's, you get told something enough times, you know, people, people are super malleable for, for better or for worse. And, but at the same time, you know, it's also a tool that can also help break down some of those barriers too. You know, it's never been easier to reach people from around the world and get to know other people from around the world. But I, obviously when people are looking at content, that's not their, they're not thinking that. You know, people, it's, it's never been easier to connect with other people, but it's also never been easier to create these like echo chambers where you're just kind of repeated the same ideas or just kind of lending into ideas that kind of just go into like confirmation bias of your own concepts. Right. You know, um, with just lots of people confirming what you believe and exactly back to you yeah. and over and over yeah. again. Yeah. What about you? What are, what are your thoughts in terms of like things that like, do you think that it should be more limited in terms of the so source of content that should be postable online or shareable online? Or do you think keeping um, it open? Like, what? you know, a lot of major platforms already do a pretty good job of keeping out most uh, harmful things. I mean, Facebook has made some major improvements uh, by force. Mm -hmm. um recently so so you know i think it's more like what the person chooses to view because on facebook you can still see like people getting in fights and you can still see people uh you know like doing some kind of prank about someone being a gold digger or you can do mm -hmm. you can see some kind of video i mean it's not going to help you it's entertainment and if that's the type of entertainment that you're seeking then it should it should cause you to ask a deeper question about you know why you're entertained by that and then connect that back to like what's missing like what could mm -hmm. be more fulfilling instead of that you know because <clears throat> in general i think it's it's like um reveling in the failures of others and the negative you know finding negativity in others and and enjoying that and that's what you want to try to avoid um 
You know what I mean? Yeah. So any kind of content that makes someone feel like that for me, when the war, when Russia invaded Ukraine, um, when that started, like I was just, like sucked into a hole. I was just like sucked into a news yeah. trap <laughs> and it's just like reading, reading, reading. And then everyone's talking about it. And it's just like, I probably lost like a month of my life just being a zombie shocked from yeah. what was happening, you know? Mm -hmm. uh, so it can have that effect on you. You know, if you, if you look at too much stuff about war, you're going to feel really negative and aggressive mm -hmm. and you're going to feel like you've got some group of people or, or individual even to blame. And you're going to start projecting your negative emotions onto that and blaming that instead of looking at your own faults and trying to correct those. Mm -hmm. And so I feel like a lot of that uh, energy that, that, you know, people go to view those videos where it's like someone's failure and they're, they're like, that's what they like. Um, that like, there's something missing for them that they, that they really need to find personally, I, I feel like. And so, you know, maybe that's why they're out there. Maybe they're out there looking for it and then they can get led astray on the, on these platforms. Maybe, maybe that happens. Um, but I think you see that with like <laughs> troll comments and things like, like it's always, <laughs> fortunately there haven't been too many on my channel, but I mean, I imagine with your channel, your size, you probably get much more um and it's just like when people leave those sorts of comments online it's always like i, I don't care what <laughs> i don't really care what they say I, I mean i feel bad for them you know that they're in that sort of mind state where the only that they, they they're in such a position in their life that they feel it's appropriate to to leave those sorts of comments you know it's just, mm -hmm. it's a shame and I'm very fortunate that I'm not <laughs> in that position, you know? So, yeah. um, and I think it's easy, just like you said, you can kind of, once you get caught up in something, it can be very difficult to escape it. In some ways you actually dig a deeper hole for yourself and actually start searching more of it and more of it and more of it. And you just kind of, it just becomes like a vicious cycle of sorts. Um, Absolutely. Yeah. You know. All right, man, let's switch up because, uh, like, I don't want the negativity to suck us in. For uh, sure. Actually, I did have one other note that I think yeah. is really interesting, just from a psychological standpoint. I think, and this is gonna this is gonna sound horrible, but again, we do language learning, and I think when we do language learning, it's very easy to get sucked into comparisons. With we're always comparing ourselves to native speakers or other people we know who also learn the language but speak it better, and. And if this isn't appropriate, feel free to edit it out and that's fine. But one of the things that actually can be helpful is comparison in the sense of if you're ever feeling really, really, really down, the way the human mind works is looking at your achievements and ideally comparing yourself to how you were in the past and just looking at where you've grown, but also looking at other, you can look at other people and be like, oh, wow, you know. <laughs> again it's gonna sound horrible but in the sense that like i've been able to do this with my time this other person has not yeah yeah and can't and actually lead to make you feel more feel better and feel encouraged it can um it can when done in moderation so just because <laughs> you, you don't want to become like arrogant about it but you know being realistic of like okay this is i am making steps towards my goal yeah Absolutely. That's, I, I, I really like to do that. Uh, not maybe I don't directly compare myself to someone um, like competing with me or something like that, but, mm -hmm. uh, but like in performance, I might be able to do that, but overall, like as a person or as a life situation, no. And, but mm -hmm. I do feel like I do that. Sometimes I'll be like, I'll just like sit down and I'll just look around and I'll be like, like, I feel blessed. Yeah for what I have. And so that feeling gives me a lot of like satisfaction to be, to, if I'm feeling bad, I'll just sit down and I'll just think like, I'm not like, I have a house. First mm -hmm. of all, that's, that's it. So like that mm -hmm. already, like I could be living out on the street somewhere. I could be living in a hut somewhere, you know, like 
so I start to think about all the stuff that I have and like the experiences that I've had and I'm and and that's satisfying. I feel like yeah. reviewing your your greatest hits can be a really great motivational experience. Hundred percent. You get students, you know, who are based in the U.S. and who have a job in the U.S. and who have lived in the U.S. for years and are able to handle social situations in the U.S. with relative ease. And then they'll feel discouraged. But it's like you literally are in another country using a second language at a proficiency that's high enough to get a job. Yeah. Most people can't do that. You know, right. like, that's all the- <laughs> most, most people can't do that. That's a win. <laughs> you know, right. It's amazing. There are so many people who aren't grateful for what they have. Maybe, maybe I think, you know, being grateful balances people out a lot because you have to accept that you that you have something and um a lot of people want to believe that they don't have anything it's like it's kind of like a weakness for some people i feel like when they admit that they have something that's valuable they immediately feel like they are a target for people who don't have this and therefore there are people Mm. who don't want to take it and Mm. so they become more like defensive towards that or they think like they rationalize i shouldn't have this thing of value because it will attract like because that will make people want to take it from me that'll make so so it's like a negative attitude towards money or valuable things or success and so people will stop themselves because they'll subconsciously be you know trying to throw a monkey wrench in the plan you also get like imposter syndrome just like people be like oh I, i got this thing but i don't deserve it you know right just, um serving of success this is another yeah. another big mm-hmm. one yeah yeah you know you've worked with students in both in the states and out of the states right mm-hmm. so students who are not in the states what's something that they maybe believe about the states that isn't true or like a lot of people repeat it or like a, it could be as simple as a stereotype mm-hmm like I love a good cheeseburger, but uh, but maybe there's something more that they've told you that they. Mm. What are some ideas they bring about the states into the lessons? Mm-hmm. Good question. Um, I mean, it's just if you're just going by like news stories and things like that, I think a lot of people are concerned about like safety issues in the states. Mm-hmm. I think there's a general assumption that everyone in the U.S. has a gun what's the percent i think the percent is like i think it's like one in five people it's like, i think it's around 20 25 percent at least from the studies i've seen wow i didn't know that like, um and I'd, I'd have to find this, this study again so and that may have been dated too so it could be different now um but regardless is the majority of people in the u.s do not own a gun um but i think there's the perception that majority of people in the u.s do own a gun um we're all cowboys out here is, right <laughs> It's that um, food again, like burgers and fries. Yeah, I, I don't remember the last, honestly, the last time I had a burger, but um, <laughs> fine. <laughs> um, another one too I get a lot is, and this one's always always find interesting. So I'm half black. My dad is black, and there's a lot of people who are, I think are very curious about black vernacular and black English and. Mm-hmm this assumption that black people speak a different English than everyone else, which, which again, kind of gets into the kind of stereotyping, a thing that we, we, we talked a little bit about earlier and yeah, I mean, you can find black people that talk the way that you're imagining it to be, but you're also like, I have plenty of family members that don't talk anything <laughs> like that at all. I don't, I can, I mean, there's also like code switching and things like that involved, right. you know, again, this is just kind of like the, the grouping feature rather than seeing the individual. And I think a lot of people also kind of fail to realize potential harm that comes with those stereotypes. Cause they, it's just, and there's even people in the U S that have that as well. It was like, Oh, it's just a joke or like all oh, this and all this, but they don't understand like the actual impact that, those sorts of beliefs, even just to believe that it's a joke, um, can, can have on people. Like, I think, I think a lot of other people around the world aren't 
aware of all of the racial things that have happened in the U.S. to the explicit benefit of people who are in power, Mm -hmm. you know, which is what you do. I mean, if you're in power, you do everything you can to keep the power, you know, Mm -hmm. and that's just... Yeah, I don't care what country, and that's how that's just how it goes, you know. And I think a lot of people aren't aware of all the things that have gone into place for that to happen. Like people don't understand why why are some sections of a city so different from other sections of the city without actually looking at the history of the city and how things came to be. You mm-hmm. know, things aren't just happening per chance. Like this is these are things that have solidified after generations. You know, and it takes time for those sorts of situations to change. So I, th- I think that's something that also comes into mind when asking about what do other people think about when they view the U.S. I think those are like I think some people have a general idea about U.S. history, but again, so they they haven't lived here, they haven't studied extensive U.S. history. Nor nor I mean, if you're not planning on being here, you don't have to. But I do think if you are planning on being in the U.S. or living in the U.S., I think it can be helpful to understand or any country you go to, trying to understand the history of the region that you're living in to get an idea of how do we arrive at this point. You know, I, th- I think history is a super valuable subject that it's worth more time studying than people generally give it. Yeah. And I'd, I'd like to add, and maybe, maybe you'll have a, a counter to this too, uh, that it's important to learn that country's history, how they tell it. Because Ooh, yeah. uh, you might have learned something about U.S. history mm-hmm. and you might uh, come to the States and argue that point with people. And when you go to the country, everybody believes the same history, more or less. So, uh, I mean, when you get into technical points or, or specifics, then maybe they, uh, they have some different beliefs. But... Um, you know, in other countries, history is taught differently. And so in, in the same about your home country, uh, in the States, they've probably butchered the the history of your country and, and taught it in a completely different way. No. And so people probably think of it differently. So, um, <laughs> so I just wanted to add that yeah, little. Yeah. I mean, I would study multiple. I would, I would say <laughs> study both perspectives like take a look at both get all the get as many perspectives as you can i mean the more the better um yeah. i love when elections come around like i i look at reddit occasionally and when elections come around some of my favorite places to go are the the opposite side because i just I, I think i mean that's just just people in general i think we get so obsessed with our own perspective that we don't spend time to listen we don't spend time to actually just hear not only what the other side is saying, but also how they arrived at that thought. And it's not even saying like, I think sometimes there's almost this, this fear that if you do that, then you're just accepting the other side. And it's like, no, you don't have to, you don't have to accept it, but you're just trying to get, you're just trying to, I think the goal with a debate isn't an argument. The goal of the debate is actually, I think to listen to the other side and get a, a better idea of how do they arrive at this whole mindset, because obviously you didn't arrive there yourself, but they did. So they've gone through some sort of experience that has led them to that conclusion. And that doesn't, again, mean that you have to agree with what they're saying, but just taking the time to be like, oh, that's, you, you have this view on taxes because of this, or you have this view on a policy because of this. Cool. I have a greater understanding of the, the issue now. Like, if we, I think there's just a lack of listening that Mm -hmm. that often occurs that's so true and students see things from the news in the states and tv shows and movies and our culture the united states exports its culture so much across the world like you go to small towns in in foreign countries and they know the famous american people or they've seen the Mm -hmm. movie they know the song and for us, it's shocking. It's a little, it's a little like comforting. It's like, ah, you know, you have something in common, but, um, you know, how much do you think those things actually reflect real life in the United States? Movies, TV shows, that stuff. 
Like if we had to, if we had to put a percentage to it, what percentage of it actually shows real America? What do you think? Again, the whole reason why it's able to grow in the media is because it's, we, we talked earlier about just being controversial, you know, it's, it's hyperbolic, you know, it's, it's taking the most extremes of things and then amplifying it another like to the 10th degree, you can get some insights into how a culture operates. You can see, you get an idea of like values and things like that, but they're going to be so exaggerated from the norm. Um, so like I would say if you peel back the layers, you're probably left with maybe, I don't know, 30%. <laughs> if I'm just pulling a number, if you had to <laughs> give me a percentage, what would you say? I don't know. 30% sounds generous, probably. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> maybe, maybe 10. I don't know. I, like, it's, I feel well, like so many of the situations that come up in there, and, and I feel like mm-hmm. we can't just point, we can't just, um, we can't just call out, you know, people in other countries watching our media because the media here also influences how Americans think does. of America. In one of my groups, someone had mentioned watching Friends. You, you already know probably that. What's the show that English language learners go to when they want to learn English? What's the show? It's friends. Like, it's like everyone's always doing Friends. Everyone's doing Friends. And I said that I personally don't really enjoy Friends. I never really liked Friends. I never watched Friends. And they're like, oh, wow, you didn't like Friends. It's like, no, because it does, I, I, I had a hard time connecting with 20 something year old white people living in a New York apartment that they all somehow could afford it. Like, it's just, like it's, I, I just have no connection. I, I have no connection to any of this, you know, mm-hmm. they didn't, they didn't look like me. They didn't talk like me. They didn't live a lifestyle that I did. Like I didn't find their jokes funny. Like it, it's just like, I just had the, I had no urge like to just, do that show and that's fine i mean they obviously have resonated with so many people but i think this kind of speaks to again that if you're you know approaching like oh i need to learn america and you're you're basing it off of a, a show like that i mean yeah it's gonna capture some elements of it but there is by no means any way that you can apply that to the country as a whole yeah my favorite is when people are like They'll, they'll be like, oh, friends, you know, this thing happened. And so friends, like I've, I've seen, I've seen it a million times. So, so like, I, I know it, but there was a time when I had never seen it before I started teaching English mm-hmm. <laughs> and, uh, and people would be like, oh, you don't know this thing, but it's from the United States. And so like every time when I go to another country, someone will come up and be like, Oh, this person or this thing or this company or, and, and I'm like, Hey, I don't know it, but, but that's, oh, you must not be from the United States. If you don't know this thing. A <laughs> hundred. My pop culture knowledge is so bad guys. I work. I have a, I have a four year old son. I have a wife. I do my best to keep happy. Um, and I, I work in the evenings. When do people when do people have time to watch movies? Like I'm so like, <laughs> when does this happen? I'm so confused. My pop culture knowledge has never been. I've just never been interested in it. There is a very good chance that everyone here, um, listening to this, knows much more about American pop culture than than I do. My my wife knows a decent amount, so like she'll name someone and then I'll say, <laughs> no idea who it is. and then she just. I, I constantly disappoint her. <laughs> She's just like, oh, I forgot. You just don't know yeah, anything. Yeah, yesterday my wife went to the Ed Sheeran concert. And I couldn't I, tell you a song by it. I'll put that. I, I know his name, but I could not tell you one song by him. Right. I've heard his name before, too. And so someone was like, oh, where's where's your wife? I was like, oh, she's with some guy, Ed. Like, <laughs> I don't know. I don't really know him. I don't know who this guy is. <laughs> I, I connect with that on many levels. Yeah. Yeah. So do you ever watch British English shows or Australian English shows or, or like hmm. is most of the content that you consume in American English? Good question. Um, I'll put it this way. If my wife is like watching a British show, mm-hmm. she watches way more. She, she has the Netflix subscription. She does, that you uh, again usually if I'm like working on videos or teaching like that's 
if she's not working on like work stuff, then she's, you know, Netflixing or whatever. Um, <laughs> so every now and then, like I'll watch an episode with her and she, she watches a range of stuff. Um, like what, like Bridgerton that's British, right? Maybe that's the, uh, I don't know. Is, uh, <laughs> if anyone watched that, <laughs> it was the one about like the, the Royal family and they like reimagined it. Like if like black people were basically in positions of, power with the monarchy and stuff like that or something yeah um so i think that was british she's watched some other british based shows but then she also watches um american based stuff too yeah um so are there any english accents and when i say english i don't mean only british english it could mm. be american english that you have trouble understanding as a native speaker i mean general british english is fine but mm -hmm. they're once you start getting into like the boondocks in England and stuff like that, that's uh, you know, that's you know, like your your heavy Scottish or Irish accents are not going to be easy. Um, I've always had trouble understanding people with a thick Louisiana accent. Mm, that's really interesting you say that because I have a <laughs> I have a group of one student who he's Indian, I believe, and he's decided. That's his accent. Really? He was just studying. Who was he? I forget. He was, he's basically modeled his English after a rapper. It was it like Tech Nine or someone? So he speaks like this super heavy Louisiana drawl. <laughs> 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 and that, that was his choice. And he's really good at it. <laughs> um, I, I can see, you know, like your southern like country areas and things like that. I can see that being difficult. Um, we lived in Texas for a time. I don't remember there being any like Texas accents that we had a hard time with. I think yeah. the Louisiana one, why it's so hard for me is because of the like, a lot of the sounds are like eaten or, or you know, like mm. re reduced a lot. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and then there's like that French Creole mix mm -hmm. thrown in. So there's mm -hmm. random stuff happening in the middle of a bunch of words that I would pronounce differently. You know mm -hmm. what I mean? Mm -hmm. So it's like you catch half the sentence and then they say something. You're kind of like, what was that? And <laughs> like, I've, I found some videos online of like people from Louisiana talking and I was, I was just watching it over and over again. I was like, how am I going to explain this to someone? <laughs> and like, I've met people from Louisiana who I could completely understand too, just like with slight, right pieces of that accent but but like someone from like the streets of new orleans they uh like it, it's hard for me to sometimes to understand that mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. i could definitely see that i have not personally had the pleasure of hearing that yet um but i could see that um i'd probably throw even like maybe in like appalachia it's so like your yeah east coast mountain range in the u.s um in the country you know my mining areas mm -hmm. heavily West Virginia, Kentucky, yeah. mm -hmm. Virginia, mm -hmm. Tennessee, uh, Tennessee. I mean, even the southern parts of Ohio to a degree. Once you get actually around, like kind of like Cincy area, um, uh, some of the region, like you go to the super tiny towns. I mean, they can speak some pretty heavy accents as well. Like oil becomes all, like it gets all oh. from the car, <laughs> like stuff like that. It's like okay. <laughs> um, He's on an oil field. Yeah, 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 yeah. Like, but it's kind of tricky too because I, I think we had talked about this before. Just accents are kind of in a, an interesting position in the U.S. because the accents that our parents grew up with are, in some ways, kind of disappearing, um, especially like in your larger metropolitan areas, just because people move around so much. Um, so. There, there's a great chance that, you know, if you go to LA or if you go to Chicago or if you go to New York, um, you know, your, your big cities, um, you may not even hear a, a super wide range of accents because the Midwestern has kind of taken over. Um, you know, there's always some tiny, like little phonol phonological things that come up, but for the, by and large, you're not going to hear the dramatic accents that, if you had traveled, you know, even 50 years ago. Yeah. But I think you would have seen. I, I definitely agree with that. I think a lot of people speak the, or try to speak like the, the standard or non-regional uh, 
mm-hmm. accent. And, but then you'll always get that random person who is like, I'm from New York. And you will I'm tell you with every word that I say. Yeah. And yeah. Which is great. Cause I, I love that. I love hearing thick, heavy. I mean, I'm from Philadelphia. Philadelphia has a lot of accents in different parts of Philadelphia have different accents. We were just there um, about a month ago and it's really interesting too, seeing the difference between kids versus their parents. Cause a lot of times they won't necessarily have the same accents. You know, the parents yeah. might have the, the regional stuff, but then the kids don't you know, that happened to several of my friends. Um, it's nice if you grow up with it because then you hear it again and it's just kind of like this wave of nostalgia just says you're like oh this is look at that they're doing that <laughs> and sometimes there's different vocabulary like when I lived in Wheeling West Virginia Pittsburgh Pennsylvania was the was the nearest like big city with a big football team yeah. so when we would go over there or we there are also a lot of people from there studying yeah. at our university you and, and your so, yins, yeah. Yins, they would say yins <laughs> instead of y'all or you all or you guys. They'd say yins. What's yins yeah. doing? Yeah, there's that. I mean, in Philadelphia, it's, it's still a lot of like the the water instead of water. Um, wow. There's still people in the U.S. Like, for instance, sometimes my I never really did it, but my brother does it sometimes. So like, he'll he'll go to a restaurant, you know, ask for water, and they're like, "What? Like, ask for water? Can I have some water?" <laughs> um. My my also, grandpa would yeah. say warder. Oh, re- what the? Can you do that again? Or warder. Yeah, super rare. That's super. It's such a great. I love this like the accent stuff. I think it's so. I, I like it so much. Like when you hear like a like a heavy boss accent, like accent, get to the cat and like stuff like that. Like um, <laughs> yeah. Or like when you meet those like people from like like Brooklyn and stuff like that. You know, I grew up in Brooklyn. Like um, it's it's so great to hear, and it's. But at the same time, you know, there's new. I. I was just reading a study talking about new accents that are forming in the U.S. Because, I mean, that's the, and that's the thing, because they always shift, you know, so there's going to be new things that are happening. And there are some val, like the, the one of the ones that I remember, I have to find the name of the study again, but they were looking at the S eh sound versus the A eh sounds, so like your, your best versus bass, or like, um, like pen versus pan. Mm-hmm. Um, and one of the things that they were saying was that the S eh sound is slowly disappearing in a lot of regions of the country. Kind of shifting more towards the ah movement um so that's kind of something to keep an eye on for the next hundred years or so is, is american <laughs> english still going to have an eh sound <laughs> moving forward um yeah i hope people don't call it an ag instead of an egg <laughs> <laughs> i don't know we'll see i mean i think a lot of language learners are probably like that because they already confused those enough anyways but um yeah who, who knows we'll see you know it's it's yeah, interesting it's seeing true. Uh, pronunciation shift yeah so you lived in texas before right we lived there from 2010 to 2014 okay yeah. so did you have to assimilate like students from the other, mm-hmm. from other countries mm-hmm. when they move to the states they kind of have to assimilate with the culture and the language and whatever you studied in your books i guarantee it's going to be about 10 percent of that when you go out on the street mm-hmm. and talk to someone. Mm-hmm. So Mm -hmm. like um, when you moved to Texas, did you have to kind of go through that same assimilation Uh, process? You know the language, but there are some differences. mm -hmm. And and, yeah, what can you tell us about that? There are. I mean, I mean, Texas, again, you also have to keep in mind, is super influenced by just Mexican culture, especially, I mean, we're in San Antonio. Um, Once you get up like farther north to like Dallas and things like that, things kind of start shifting a little bit more. But um, San Antonio is still kind of thicket, really large Hispanic population. (laughs) Mm-hmm. Um, so there's kind of two parts to that. I would say, no, I don't, I didn't have to like ch- adjust my speech or anything, but at the same time, I'm kind of the wrong person to ask because I mean, I was working at a language center with other teachers who, I mean, you've probably seen this in general. If you work in ESL in the U S and you're not in like a school district, then long term, you're probably not staying in the U.S. Long term, you're probably going to be moving, whether you're doing like the jet program or, or moving the well before China did their education crackdown, uh, moving to China or Taiwan or, or whatever, um, or Middle East to to make the big bucks. Um, and so, a lot of people I was I was working with had, were had already taught abroad, were would eventually teach abroad again. Um, and we're also working with 
students who are, you know, by and large adults, you know, so, so even on weekends, you know, we'd be hanging out with other teachers, occasionally hanging out with students and things like that, you know, so the, the people I was hanging out with, um, yeah, some of the teachers were from Texas, but our background was a little bit different. Like, I personally didn't meet like a whole lot of people like f born and raised in San Antonio and they're still there now. Okay. In my, so I'm kind of the wrong person to ask. But the, the short answer is no. Like when I talked to locals, it wasn't like I had to change um, uh -huh. my accent. I, I, did you notice but, like some linguistic or cultural differences while you were there though? Yeah, I mean, it, it's super, depending on especially what part of town you're in, it's super influenced by, again, Hispanic culture. Now that is parts of it are changing. I mean, you're seeing a lot of, a lot of cities in the U.S. are going through just varying stages of gentrification. So it's... um. I don't even know if I would recognize San Antonio if I went there today. It's, it's changed a lot in the last 10 years. Um, but, you know, they, they, there are, you know, you have your traditionally Hispanic neighborhoods. Um, uh, architecturally, you, know, you can see some of those influences, especially in key parts of the town. That also kind of brings up again, like gentrification is impacting a lot of cities in the U.S. And where does it usually start? It usually starts in areas that are, relatively cheaper who lives in the places that are relatively cheaper well you're, you're also typically dealing with your minorities and other you know a, a diverse range of cultures and things like that so I, I wouldn't be surprised if kind of the linguistic richness that you see in a lot of these areas starts to disappear over time yeah what well, you were in texas as well uh, it was such a long time ago. I was a little kid and it was like my great grandparents lived there. Um, but yeah, I mean, from what I remember as a kid, you know, it was all, I, I had like the, what do you call it? The bolo tie and like the cowboy hat and I had like cowboy boots and I was like walking around like that, you know, you can um, definitely find that in Texas. You can <laughs> definitely find that in Texas. I remember that we went to a buffet in in texas somewhere it was near san antonio i believe okay the that was that was a cultural experience yeah <laughs> i think texas for those of you who, do, who don't really know much about texas texas is a really unique state because it's probably one of the few states in the country that's like if you ask most texans like who do they support it's t texas first country <laughs> second like this, the state's rights in Texas is huge. They are all about Texas. And I've never seen that sort of state pride before. I mean, you're, you go to your schools, where are schools teaching? They're, they're teaching Texas history. Um, they yeah. pledge allegiance, but they also pledge to Texas in school. <laughs> which is, the, it's the same pledge that they just say, I pledge allegiance. To Texas, <laughs> like it's like the same. It's like the same flag. It just replaces with Texas. Um, they have these. They fly like you know the U.S. flag is all over the place. The Texas flag is all over the place. Um, yeah, I went to the Alamo when I was there. Of course, everyone. But I mean, it's funny with the Alamo because like you. I mean, the Alamo. If you ever go to the Alamo, is like this. It, it, it's a mission. It's a famous location where there was a battle. Um, but it's surrounded by the city. It's it's there's like a Ripley's, believe it or not, store like across the street. <laughs> At least last time I was there. Um, That's funny. There's a bunch of like tourist attractions and stuff like that. Um, yeah. The, what I will say about my probably one of the best parts of Texas is the food. If you're into barbecue, um, Texas barbecue because I in general I like more like smoky barbecue, and so Texas is better for that. Um, and also just like Mexican food, Tex-Mex, breakfast, breakfast tacos, things like that. Food's really good. Yeah. So the people who are listening are probably getting hungry and getting thirsty to visit Texas. Or, As they should. <laughs> or some of these places that we've talked about. Um, Jeff, thank you so much for taking the time to, to come on here and have this talk with me. And how can everybody find you? Yeah, for sure. You can find us um, youtube.com slash fluent American or just go to fluentamerican.com. Awesome. And we'll put all the links in the description as always. 
Jeff, thanks a lot. Thank you so much for having me. No, real pleasure. I appreciate it. All right. We'll see each other soon. Hey, sounds good. Thank you for tuning in to English World with Chris Americos. Now it's your turn. Don't just listen to English, speak English with us every day. Join our English Everyday Speaking Program today. See you in the next episode. Bye-bye.